18, Numbers chapter 18. Numbers chapter number 18. Serving in the Philippines, and uh, personally, I, I I want to see myself as a missionary from China, even though even though I came from China six years ago and and I was saved almost three years ago. So praise God for all His wonderful works He's done in in every believers. Amen. Now. Tonight I want to preach a pretty doctrinal sermon, but I will draw some application in the end. So, so I would encourage you to turn the Bible, look at these verses with you, um, with me. Numbers chapter 18, verse 19, the Bible says, in Numbers chapter 18, verse number 19, the Bible says, All the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offer unto the Lord have I given thee, and thy sons and thy daughters with thee, by statute forever. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord unto thee and to thy seed with thee. Now the title of the sermon tonight is called A Covenant of Salt. A Covenant of Salt. Now keep your finger or a bookmark at Numbers 18. Uh, we we're, we're going to leave it and going to come back to it. Now first turn to Job chapter number 6. Job chapter number 6. Now salt is mentioned multiple times in the Bible. You know the word salt is mentioned in 35 verses in the Bible. The Bible talks about salt sea, you know as, as we commonly refer to it as being the dead sea. Now the phrase a covenant of salt or the salt of the covenant is mentioned three times in the Old Testament. So tonight I want to talk about what does that phrase mean and what application we can draw from the phrase a covenant of salt. But, but first, just, just talk about salt in general. We know that salt, number one, can be used as a nutrient, right? People consume salt, and without salt, we, we will literally die. Now, here's, here's something that, that's pretty interesting about salt. If, if, if you know the chemi chemical formula of salt, salt is composed with sodium chloride, right? Now, what's funny about it is sodium is, is a highly unstable alkaline metal. It's highly reactive because sodium, the sodium atom only has one, one electron in the outer valence shell. And in order for an atom to be stable, you have to have eight electrons on the outer shell. They call it the octet rule. So sodium atom only has one electron, so it's a highly unstable alkaline metal. While chlorine gas is toxic. So what's interesting about table salt, sodium chloride, is if you combine a highly unstable alkaline metal with a, with a, with a toxic gas, you became table salt. No, we can use that. You know, we can consume that. So, you know, we, we should praise God's perfect creation. Even the elements, even the heavens, you know, proclaim the glory of God. Amen? Now, salt can keep you hydrated. You know, it, can, it can help you. It can help with the muscle growth. So we see, in very general, salt as a nutrient. But number two, salt can also be used as a seasoning. People adding flavors, right, using salt. In Job chapter 6, look at verse number 6. Job chapter 6, verse number 6, the Bible says, can that which is unsavory, unsavory means without taste, can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? So this verse is pretty simple, right? So the Bible is saying we should, we should add salt to things that are without flavor. You know, that's why people sometimes add salt to eggs, you know. And if you are Chinese, sometimes we, we add sugar to, to the eggs. And, 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 if, and if you are these guys who, who, who add ketchup on, on everything else, then so be it. But the Bible is basically saying we should add salt as flavor, just literally speaking, right? Now, now I look this verse up in other modern uh, corrupted translations. Now, in, 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 King, in the King James Bible, the Bible is pretty clear, right? Can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? Now, here is the New World Translation, okay? Now, you look down at your King James. Here, let me read from you the New World Translation. Will tasteless things be eaten without salt, or is there any taste in the slimy juice of marshmallow? Now, here's the problem. Some people think the New Translation are just simply making things easy to understand, but they are changing it for the sake of changing it. You know, they are from the devil. They are corrupting the doctrines of God, you know? So... Go, go, go to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. So we see salt as a nutrient. Number two, salt as a seasoning. But the Bible also mentions salt as a seasoning, as a symbol. We know that we're literally adding salt to food to add flavor. But in Colossians chapter 4, look at verse number 6. Colossians chapter 4, look at verse number 6. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 4, verse number 6, Let your speech be always 
with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. So, so not only we should adding uh, salt to food, literally, right? But we should also adding salt to our daily conversation, our speech, our daily conduct. Now, what does the Bible mean to have our speech seasoned with salt? Is to be always with grace, that we may know to answer every man. Now, now you don't have to turn there, but this verse um, makes me think of. Uh, for First Peter chapter three verse fifteen, but, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So, so the thing is, what does it mean to have your speech be always seasoned with grace, seasoned with salt? Which means we should add good flavor to your speech. We should add good flavor to your daily conversation, to your lifestyle, even now. Now, and I heard one preacher talk about every time when you're about to say something or you're about to answer someone's question, ask yourself three questions. Number one, is it true? Sometimes when you are addressing some things, you don't even know if, if that's true or not. Sometimes when you are addressing some arguments about the Bible, make sure you first know if it's true and then you respond to them. So first, you have to ask yourself, is it true? Number two, is it kind? Just because something is true, that, that, that has nothing to do with what you're going to say is kind. So even if it's true, make sure what you say is kind. Let your truth be always filled with mercy and love. But, but just because something is true or something it might be kind, number three, ask yourself, is it necessary? Sometimes it's not our place to tell someone what's wrong. Sometimes it's not our authority. So we have to... Always ask ourselves three questions when we are about to address, about to say something. Is it true? Is it kind? And is it necessary? And the other thing is, the Bible, um, the Bible says in Colossians chapter 4, the verse number 6, that ye how ye ought to answer every man. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, the Bible also says we need to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope. The, answer, the emphasis of, of answer is to men, not necessarily to a question. The problem is, sometimes questions, objections, arguments, they don't really need an answer. People do. Sometimes we are so focused on uh, destroying someone's argument that we forgot to answer the person. That's what the Bible says. We ought to answer every man. You know, one of the common objections from the atheists are, if God exists, then why are there so many evil and sufferings and pain? Now, we, we can answer that biblically. We can answer that logically. We can even give them a moral argument about, about why does God allow evil I, I'm not against that. In fact, we should use the Bible to answer our faith. But, but most of the time when people address that argument, you know, they've, they've been hurt in their past. Maybe, maybe they've, they've lost their family. Maybe, they, maybe they've lost their parents when they are young. So when we are answering a question, adding good flavors, let your conversation, let your speech be filled with grace, seasoned with salt, and to answer to the person, not necessarily the argument. Sometimes we may win the argument and lose the person. That's what the Bible says. We should let our speech season with salt, adding good flavors to our conversation. Now, let's go back to Numbers chapter 18. Numbers chapter 18. So, number one, I talk about we use salt as a nutrient, you know, for daily living. Number two, I talk about use salt as seasoning. Not only adding on little food, but we should add in salt, adding good flavor to our lifestyle, to our speech, to our conversation. Number three. People use salt throughout the ages to preserve food, right? To, to, to be used as a preservant. Now, number three, I, I want to talk about salt as a preservation to certain groups of individuals. Now, in Numbers chapter 18, verse number 19, the Bible says, Numbers 18, verse 19, here is God talking to Aaron. All the heave offerings of the holy things which, which the children of Israel offer unto the Lord have I given thee and thy sons and thy daughters with thee by statute forever. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord unto thee and to thy seed with thee. Now God has given uh, Aaron and his children, they are entering into a covenant of salt forever with God. Now the first thing we can take away from that is uh, God is teaching them, God is teaching Aaron and, and his household that we should rely upon God for our sustenance. The Bible says in verse number 
24, in the, in the same chapter, Numbers 18, verse 24, the Bible says, But the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer as an heave offering unto the Lord, I have given to the Levites to inherit. Therefore I have said unto them, Among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance, because these Levites, the priests, are living off the tithes of the people. So God, uh, one application when God is entering to a covenant of Saul with Aaron and, and his children is they want them to rely upon God for their sustenance, for their provision. But, but there's another aspect of the phrase, the covenant of salt. Notice there's a phrase coming up over and over again. In verse, verse number 19, the Bible says, By a statute forever, it is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord. So the thing is, when God makes a promise, you know, you have... You, expect he's going to keep the promise. And one of the deeper applications of, of this passage of the phrase, the covenant of salt, is God promised to Aaron and, and his household that he's going to preserve the priesthood. You know, and, and, the, and, and the prophecy was ultimately fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that the Bible says Jesus Christ, uh, this, this man had an unchangeable priesthood. Jesus Christ not being a descendant from Aaron, he, he can, he's not qualified uh, to be a priest according to the Mosaic law. That's what the Bible says, he is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You know, Melchizedek, as, as people sometimes refer to as a, 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 a Christophany or just a type of Christ, you know, Melchizedek is without father, without mother, he's a king, a king of Salem. So Jesus Christ is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek according to Hebrews chapter number 7. So this promise, God trying to preserve uh, the priesthood, is ultimately fulfilled in, in a person and the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Bible also says in Numbers chapter 18, verse number 20, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, Thou shalt have no inheritance in their land, neither shalt thou have any part among them. I am thy part and thine inheritance among the children of Israel. Just like God entering into a covenant of salt forever with Aaron and his household, we as safe Christians can also apply the same, can also apply the same principle. We don't have the inheritance of this world because once we are saved, we are entering into a covenant of salt forever with God. He promised he's going, he's going to preserve us. He promised he's going to give us the daily provision and sustenance as long as we are faithful to God. Because a sword sometimes in the ancient uh, culture can be used as, as a seal of faith, as a seal of promise. That's why the Bible gave us the phrase, a covenant of salt. Go to Second Chronicles chapter 13. Second Chronicles chapter number 13. So, so we saw salt can be used as a preservation of certain individuals. I talk about Aaron and his children. But in Second Chronicles chapter 13, uh, the, the same phrase it has been mentioned, but but it, but it's about David and his descendants. In Second Chronicles chapter thirteen, look at verse number five. Second Chronicles chapter thirteen, look at verse number five. The Bible says, "Ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons by a covenant?" Of salt. So just like God has entered into a covenant of salt with Aaron and his children, God also promised David and his descendants they are entered into a covenant of salt with God. And notice that the Bible says uh, he's giving the kingdom of Israel to David forever. Again, the promise is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But, but we, can, we can also uh, find a long-suffering God, because if you know the history, you know what happened to, to, to the kingdom of Israel. There's a split between the, king, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. So God kept the promise. God kept the covenant of salt even after the kingdom is split, even after the, uh, they, are, they are being taken captive for 70 years. Because once God makes a promise, expect he's going to keep it forever. Because once, once God has entered the, the covenant of Saul with David, you know, ultimately we know that Jesus Christ, as being mentioned in Revelation chapter 5, verse number 5, the Bible says Jesus Christ has been the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Indeed, God kept a remnant to fulfill the promise. It is a covenant of Saul. Go to 1 King chapter 15. 1 King chapter number 15. So we also see a long suffering God. Just like God promised to preserve Aaron and his children, God promised to preserve David and his descendants. In 1 Kings chapter 15, look at verse number 1. 
First King 15, verse number 1. The Bible says in First King chapter 15, verse number 1, Now in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, reigned Abijam over Judah. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Mekah, the daughter of Abishalom. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father. Now, we know that there are a lot of bad kings, you know, both in Israel and Judah. And in this case, we know that the, we know that the king has sinned. You know, the king's heart is not perfect with God. But notice verse number 4. The Bible says in 1 Kings 15, verse number 4, Nevertheless, for David's sake... Did the Lord, his God, give him the lamp in Jerusalem to set up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem? So even after uh, David's descendant, they messed up. But nevertheless, for David's sake, did, 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 did the Lord preserve him a remnant, pres preserve him a seed? Because God had entered a covenant of salt with David and his descendant. And when he makes a promise, expect he's going to keep it forever. Go to Psalm 89. Psalm 89. So number one, I talk about a God entered the covenant of salt with Aaron and his children. We also, we also see number two, that God had entered the covenant of salt with David and his descendants. But now I want to talk about once we are saved, we are also enter into a covenant of, of salt with God. Psalm chapter 89, look at verse number 29. Psalm 89, verse 29. The Bible says in Psalm 89, verse 29, the Bible says, His seed, talking about the seed of Christ, His seed also will I make to endure, notice the next two words, forever. And His throne as the days of heaven. And if His children, and if God's children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes, Notice verse 33, nevertheless. It's, it's, the, it's the same word when God told, told David and his descendants, right? Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. See, this is my favorite passage in the Old Testament teaching about the eternal security of the believers. You know, now... People always talk about, you are these once saved and always saved Baptists. You know, they, they are claiming, you meant to tell me I can do what I want to do if I got saved, I can never lose my salvation? Yes, but God will never leave you unpunished. You know, if we sin, grace will abound, but shall we? God forbid. And that's what the Bible says in Romans chapter number 6. Now the Bible is clear in, in, in this verse, if his children, verse number 30, if God's children forsake my law, if they mess up their life, if, if they walk not in my statutes, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I, will God visit their transgression with a rod and their iniquity with stripes. God is going to punish you. God is going to give you a spiritual spanking. Amen. But in verse number 30, th verse number 33, does that mean you lose your salvation? No. Verse 33, the Bible says, Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him. Why? Verse 34, once we are saved, we are entering into a covenant forever with God. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Just like when David's descendants messed up, the Bible says, For David's sake, I have set upon Jerusalem a light. So when we sin, nevertheless, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, he died and rose again. He's not going to break his covenant. Just like God had entered a covenant of salt with Aaron and his children, with David and his children, once we are saved, all believers have entered into a covenant of salt forever with God, and his covenant is not going to break it. Go to John chapter 10. John chapter number 10. While you are turning there, let me read from you Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. You go to John chapter number 10. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, In whom you also trusted, after that you have, you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the, the, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Once you are saved, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. But, but I want you to pay attention to, to the next verse, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. 
Remember when God told Aaron and his children that I am thy inheritance? See, everything is so perfectly aligned in the Bible. That's why the Bible can't be written by man. If you really study that, everything is so perfect. You know, he's entered into a covenant forever with us, as he did, you know, with all the Old Testament sins. In John, in John chapter 10, verse 27, we, we, we have all heard, heard this verse over and over again, but let us look at this verse together. John chapter 10, look at verse number 27. John chapter 10, verse 27. The Bible says in John chapter 10, verse 27, here's, here's, here's the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Now, I've used that illustration before, but, uh, but, but let me use that again. Some people think once you get saved, you know, God is losing your hand, uh, God is holding your hand. You know, God will never let you go, but you can walk away. Now, here's the problem. Once you are saved, God is holding your hand, right? And if you walk away, that makes you stronger than God. And that is simply not possible, and that's blasphemous. Because the Bible says, once you get saved, God is holding your hand, and no man is able to plug them out of my Father's hand. No man, including yourself. Which means once you are saved, you are always saved, and you can never walk away from God, because you are not stronger than God. See, being saved, uh, keep, keep being saved does not depend on you, it depends on a faithful God. That was in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, because we had entered into a covenant of salt forever with God. Go, to, go, to, go back to uh, Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter number 18. Genesis chapter number 18. So number one, I talk about salt as a nutrient. You know, we, we use salt to preserve life, right? Number two, I talk about salt as a seasoning. Not, not only adding a bound food, but adding flavors in our lifestyle, in our conversation. Number three, I talk about uh, the preservation of individuals. Talking about Aaron and his household, David and his household, and all believers. Point number four. Here's where I really want to dive in to, to, uh, of this sermon. Point number four, the preservation of a nation. The preservation of a nation. In Genesis chapter 18, we see a famous story before, before God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible says in Genesis 18, look at verse number 20. Genesis 18, verse number 20. The Bible says, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their cry is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it, which come unto me, and if not, I will know. So, so, here, so here's, I believe, someone is crying to God about how wicked Sodom is. You know, they're, they're crying uh, because their sin is, is very grievous. So God heard their cry, and, and God says, I will go down now to verify you know, whether if they are, what they're saying is true, whether they are indeed that wicked. And, 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 if that, and if they are indeed that wicked, he's going to destroy the whole city, okay? Now, now keep your finger at that chapter. Uh, turn, turn, if you would, to, uh, to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13. Now, this is the pattern that God instructed the Old Testament saints to follow before they are wiping out the whole city. Sometimes you wonder, why did God command the children of Israel to, to kill everyone in the city, right? To wipe away all the Hittite, all, all the Philistines, all the, all, the, all, all the Gittite. Now, sometimes you may ask, why did God do that? To wipe out women, children, like slay all the cattle. Now, this is, the, this is the exact same pattern God instructed the Israelites to do in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 13. Look at verse number 12. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse number 12, the Bible says, If thou shalt hear say in one of thy cities, basically, you know, we know that in Sodom and Gomorrah, God has heard the cry of them, right? If thou shalt hear say in one of thy cities, which the Lord thy God hath given thee to dwell there, certain men, the children of Belial, means, means the sons of devil, the children of Belial are gone out from among you and, and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which ye have not known, then shall thou inquire, 
Right? Does that sound familiar? Guy will go down and see. Then shall thou inquire and make search and ask diligently. And behold, if it be true, and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought among you, thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of the city with the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly and all that is therein, and the cattle thereof with the edge of the sword. So this is the same pattern God follow before he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, he heard the cry of it, right? And then he went down to see whether they have done such wickedness. You know, that, that's why in the Old Testament, when God um, destroyed all these nations, you know, God, God instructed them to, to verify that, to go to the land, and then God wiped away every one of these, uh, these cities. Now, now I did um, some research about the sin of sodomy, you know, I, uh, so because I want to have an idea, um, one of the reasons that I believe God, God wiped away all these heathen nations, especially Sodom and, and Gomorrah, is because there are, there, there are like uh, illness, there are, there are diseases there, you know. Now, here, here's a stat I, I, I found um, that 83%, 83% of the homosexual men have physical relationship with 50 or more partners in their lifetime. 43% of them have physical relationship with 500 or more partners, and 28% of them with 1,000 or more partners. So according to the stats, you, you, um, you, can, you can fact check me if, if you don't believe that, but I believe this is a true stats. So according to the, the stats, more than a quarter of them have already had physical relationship with a thousand or more partners in their lifetime. So I believe the reason God wiped away all uh, these cities is because they are full of diseases, right? They are receiving themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. That's what the Bible says. Now go back to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. So we know the wickedness, we, we, know the, we know the perversion of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, in Genesis, Genesis chapter 18, we also saw Abraham's conversation with God. Abraham is trying to talk God off of destroying the city. Genesis chapter 18, look at verse number 23. Genesis 18, verse 23. The Bible says in Genesis 18, verse 23, And Abraham drew near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee shall not the judge of, the, of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Now here's the thing we, 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 have, we have to realize. God is willing to spare even the city of Sodom and Gomorrah if there are fifty righteous people within the city. Fifty, you know, I, 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 I would use the word saved people, those who are made righteous by, by Christ. There are 50 righteous, 50, 50 just people in Sodom. God's willing to spare Sodom and Gomorrah. And um, jump down to verse number, jump down to verse number 31. The Bible says, Genesis 18, verse 31, the Bible says, And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, Peradventure there shall be uh, twenty found there, and he said, I will not destroy it for twenty sake. So God will not destroy the city, even if there are twenty righteous people in the city. Verse thirty-two, and he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet, but this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there, and he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communion with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. So we have to realize that God is willing to spare even the city of Sodom and Gomorrah if there are ten righteous people in the city. So here's the thing I want you to realize is that Sodom and Gomorrah, they were not um, necessarily destroyed because of sodomy. It was destroyed because of the lack of salt. It's because there's a lack of saved Christians, it's a lack of righteous people. See, God is willing to spare the city even there are 10 righteous people in the city. So, the, so here's what I'm, what I'm getting at. People use salt to preserve certain individuals as a covenant of salt, but salt can also be used to preserve a nation. Go, go back to chapter number 15. Genesis chapter number 15. 
Genesis chapter number five, um, number 15. Look at verse number 13. Genesis 15, verse number 13. The Bible says, And he, God, said unto Abram, Abraham, Know of a surety that thy, thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. So, so here's, uh, here's God's prophecy to Abraham and, and the children of Israel. There will be a land, which is Egypt, right? And shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Verse 14. Now also that nation, Egypt, whom they shall serve, will I judge. Talking about the ten plagues. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance when they came out of um, Egypt. Verse 15. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. Why? For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So, so, so here's my um, here's my belief upon upon this passage. See, God told Abraham before the four hundred years of slavery in in in, in Egypt that 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 the Amorites they had a chance for four hundred years. See, after four hundred years, you know, I believe God is waiting, uh, like all the salt is gone, all the preservance is gone, and then. God wait until the, uh, the, they have been very sinful, they are, they are fully lack of salt, and then in the book of Joshua, God commands the children of Israel to slay in all these heathen nations. See, the, the, the principles of the covenant of salt is played throughout the Bible. And, 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 and the Bible is clear in, in this passage, in verse number 16, after 400 years, in the fourth generation, they're going to come out of Egypt, for the iniquity of the Amorites is now yet full. Which means after 400 years, they've been wicked enough. You know, there's not enough salt to preserve that nation. And that's when God destroyed them utterly, according to the book, book of Deuteronomy. Go to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter number 1. So I talk about salt to preserve a nation, about Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, about, about the Amorites, about all the hidden nations. But, but, the, but the principle of a covenant of salt also apply to the children of Israel. In Isaiah chapter 1, we, we, we have this passage is, is addressing the children of Israel before the captivity. Isaiah chapter 1, look at verse number 4. Isaiah chapter 1, verse number 4. All sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked this holy one of Israel unto anger, they are gone away backward. So here we find the children of Israel, they are a very sinful nation at that time. You know, they are, they are forsaking the Lord, they, they, are, they are being backslidden, they are provoking God to anger. But look at verse number 9. The Bible says, Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us, notice the next phrase, a very small remnant, which have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. So Bible is basically saying, the reason God did not destroy the children of Israel at that point is, there is a very small remnant. There's enough salt to preserve that nation. See, Sodom and Gomorrah, they were not destroyed necessarily because of sodomy. They were destroyed because of the lack of salt. There's not enough Christians, there's not enough saved people to preserve the nation. Now go to Ezekiel 22. Ezekiel chapter, chapter 22. So in Isaiah, we saw God spared the children of Israel, right? Before the captivity, because God had left them a very small remnant. There's still enough salt to preserve the nation. But, but, but in Ezekiel 22, we have a story during the captivity, and God did bring wrath upon the children of Israel. So what's the difference? Ezekiel 22, look at verse number 29. Ezekiel 22, verse 29. The Bible says in Ezekiel 22, verse 29. The Bible says, The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the, the stranger wrongfully. Verse number 30. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. See, the Bible says, if God, just looking for a man, if God can find that man, he's not going to de 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 destroy you know, the nation, but he can't find anyone. And in verse 
31, Therefore, that's why have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the, with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, says the Lord God. See, the reason that God brings wrath upon the children of Israel at that point is God is wanting to preserve that, but he can't find anyone. He can't find any salt. And that's why, therefore, has he rained out, has he poured out his indignation upon them. See, the, the concept of the covenant of salt is not only applied to certain individuals. It's also applied to a whole nation, to a whole city. You know, now um, go to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. So, Number one, I talk about salt being used as a nutrient, right? Number two, I talk about salt being used as a seasoning. Not only to, uh, adding flavor to food, but adding good flavors to our conversation, to our speech, to our lifestyle. Number three, I talk about um, a salt being a preservation of certain individuals, talking about to all believers, and you know, talking about the eternal security of the believers. And number four, I talk about salt uh, being used a as a preservation to a nation. Now, the Bible says that uh, we as believers are the salt of the earth. And, and, and you're in Mark chapter 9, and uh, it's very interesting that Mark chapter 9, cha chapter, uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 50, is in the context of, of hell and, and the everlasting judgment of God. And it's really interesting. In verse chapter um, 43 to, to 48, the Bible keeps talking about that hell lasts forever. And in verse chapter 50, the Bible says in Mark chapter 9, verse 50, salt is good. But if the salt have lost his saltness, wherewith shall ye, uh, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves and, and have peace one with another. So I, I think this, this verse has a strong soul winning application. You know, because in verse 43 and 48, the Bible keeps talking about hell lasts forever. And in verse 50, the Bible says, salt is good. But if salt have lost its flavor, you know, wherewith will he season it? So, because we as Christians, we have to realize that we not only, uh, once we got saved, we enter into a covenant of salt with God forever. Once we are saved, we are always saved. But we also have the power to preserve certain individuals from hell. Just like God preserve certain individuals, you not know, talking about David and his descendants, we also have the power to preserve certain individuals from hellfire. But not only that, we also have the power to preserve the whole nation from destruction. Because we need to have a preserving influence in the world. Go, go to Matthew chapter 5. This is the last verse we're going to turn to. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. See, just like salt can be used to preserve the whole nation, and we as each individual Christians can also have the power to preserve the whole nation. And, and, and really, this is how, how, how the covenant of salt is, is acting. You know, think about the end time. Right after the rapture, God is pouring out His judgment and His wrath, right? Because all the salt are gone, you know, and then God is going to pour out His judgment, right? So everything makes perfect sense, right? The salt is gone, and then God is going to, you know, rain fire and bring stone upon, upon this earth. So we cannot stop that from happening. You know, the Bible is clear in the book of... Revelation, you know, the, the, I mean, talking about the one third of man being slain, talking, talking about the locusts from the bottom's pit, all, 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 uh, it's like all these plagues, all, all this, all this uh, trumpet and vile judgment from God. We, we, um, we can't stop it because, you know, God promised that. But we as Christians do have the power to preserve our nation a little bit longer. We can get a little more people saved, you know. See, we, 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 we can't stop the end from happening. You know, it's, it's going to happen. I believe Jesus Christ is going to come back in my lifetime. But we can help get a little more people saved. We can help to preserve our nation a little, a little bit longer. We can even help to preserve other nations by sending out missionaries. Amen? By sending out people down to the outermost part of the earth. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, look at verse number th 13. Matthew 5 verse 13, the Bible says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be, be salted? It stands forth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Now, 
to be cast out, uh, it, it has nothing to do of you lose your salvation. It means simply being you are being cast out. You are you are uh, like you you'll be ashamed you know, because you have, you have done nothing for Christ. So so the point is, if you have not been actively sharing the gospel. The Bible says you are good for nothing. You know, shame on you if you have not been actually sharing the gospel. That's our, that's the whole duty of men. It's to, just to follow God, follow God's commandment, follow God's great commission. It's not just getting people saved, you know, getting them baptized, getting them to church, teach them all things, to fulfill all three parts of the great commission, okay? So you are good for nothing according to the Bible. You are not, you are good for nothing if you are not serving Christ, if you're not dedicated your life to Christ. You know, you, you might say, Brother, Brother Justin, you, 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 you just preach. You should let your conversation season with salt. <laughs> but the, the problem is, because I care about you, because I love you, I, I, I don't want you to be ashamed unto Christ. That's why I tell you this truth, you know. Do you know, do, 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 do you know what love really is? Love and grace is telling people they are going to hell if they don't believe in Jesus. You know, and, and, and what hate is... It, uh, what hate is, you are telling people, all roads lead to heaven. You can do whatever you want, and that's hate. And then some people just care about how many prayers they pray with other people, and they claim they got 10 people saved in one hour based on how many prayers they prayed. You know, you don't actually love, love that people. You don't actually love, love that people based on the prayer. You know, we should actually share the whole counsel of God. We should share the, total, the totality of the gospel. You know, don't don't focus on uh, these minor things. We should we should we should realize where our real focus is. You know, so so th that's why I have a problem when people go so many and they never mention the word hell. Here's here's my problem with that. If you never mention the word hell when you're going so many, where is that person being saved from? Because when you're talking about someone being saved, we are being saved from where? From hell. So if never mention hell, that's not a full gospel presentation. So the, the real love, according to the Bible, is telling people they are going to hell if they don't believe on Jesus Christ. And that's love. You know, that's biblical love. If you love God, keep His commandments. That's what the Bible says. Let's go back to the sermon. Uh, where am I? Okay, you are the salt of the earth. So we as Christians really need to have a preserving impact in this world. We know that... Um, Lot's wife, you know, when, 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 when she was taken out, out of the city, he looked back. She looked back, right? And then, and then God, God made him a pillar of salt. Now, 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 now this might be a, a little mean, but uh, I, think, I think God, God is saying to, uh, to, to Lot's wife, since you don't want to be a spiritual salt, let me make you a real salt. <laughs> and that's what the Bible tells us to remember lost wife, right? You know, we need to be a spiritual salt, otherwise God may cast you out. God may take you to heaven right now. You know, God, will, God may make you a real salt, like lost wife. Amen? So we as Christians really need to have a preserving impact in this world. Remember lost wife. We also need to maintain a good savor. We need to keep Salty, right? Adding salt in yourself, you know, keep yourself salty, and together we, we, can, we can make a difference. The Bible says others save with fear make a difference in this world. Because just like, just like God had entered a covenant of salt with certain individuals, with a certain nation, we also can preserve individuals from hell. We can also preserve a nation from hell. We can also preserve the whole world from destruction. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this time of preaching your word. And help us strengthen our faith. Help us be courageous to share the gospel. And help us remain the saltiness in ourselves and, and just preserve the nation, preserve our family, preserve our uh, friends, and just fulfill the Great Commission. And help us be united and strive together for the faith of the gospel. And I pray this in Jesus' name.